for the um, uh, thanks for the introduction and for the opportunity to visit. So this is my first trip to Ann Ar to, to Ann Arbor. Um, happy to be here. Um, uh, I um, I'll preface my talk by saying my flight a little bit delayed. Got to my hotel about 1.30 last night. So if if I get a little spacey in the middle, ask me a question and get me back on track. Um, but so so yeah, so I, so I'm going to be telling you all or um, some things about fluid structure interaction with a focus on numerical methods. So if you think about um, numerical methods for modeling systems involving fluid structure interaction, there's sort of are two conventional ways to do it. I, I, I put conventional in quotes because I don't, I don't know if that it's really conventional, but sort of the conventional methods often are, are, are what you might think of as body conforming methods. So this is um, this is a visualization of a fluid structure action simulation using a finite element formulation of flow past a um, flow past a obstacle with a flexible tail. You can think of this as sort of like a one uh, as a two dimensional uh, flapping flag kind of problem. And so the colors are the flow, the axial flow velocity, and um, the way that this computation works is that there's a mesh in the fluid region and there's a mesh in the structure region. And as the structure moves around, the mesh that's in the structure uh, moves and the mesh that's in the fluid moves. And you have to maintain, um, uh, at least in this particular setup, uh, conforming discretization of that fluid structure interface. Um, so the standard kinds of numerical methods that take these kinds of approaches um, include uh, well-known methods like arbitrary lagrange eulerian methods. Um, their basic features, they typically you have a separate momentum equation for the fluid and the structure, and that might seem like an obvious thing. We'll flip that around in a minute when we're talking about numerous boundary methods. The coupling is through the interface. So fluid structure interface, you have um, uh, dynamic and kinematic interface conditions. So you have force balance, and uh, no slip tell you how things happen, things, things evolve at the fluid structure interface. What's nice about these methods is that they give you high accuracy, at least in principle, all the way up to the fluid structure interface. But when you have, um, when you have structures that undergo really large deformations, meshing is a problem. Um, and, um, and then depending on exactly how you couple everything together, there's certain kinds of numerical instabilities that can show up, especially in cases where the structure is neutrally buoyant or, or sort of light compared to the background fluid um, that are called uh, artificial added mass instabilities. So I'm going to, I don't know if it really is or not, but so, so the other kind of conventional way that you can do this is, is immersed boundary methods. So immersed boundary methods, um, this, is, this is sort of my simplest example of an immersed boundary kind of computation. This is a thin elastic interface. So the configuration of the interface is this black curve. And then what I'm showing is the pressure field that's being generated by um, forces that are applied by this, this curve. So you can think of this as like a slice of a water balloon or something like that. So there's fluid on the inside, there's fluid on the outside. Um, the interface is immersed in the fluid. And we have a mesh, uh, in this case, just a, just a one-dimensional uh, discretization of the interface that is able to move freely through a um, Eulerian discretization of the fluid. So I've got a Cartesian grid here that I'm using to um, solve the incompressible Navier Stokes equations. This is a locally refined grid. And um, in, uh, in practice, I'm not going to say a lot about adapted mesh refinement, but the locally refined grid is adapted to track the moving interface. So um, uh, immersed boundary methods were, were introduced by, uh, by Charlie Peskin in his, uh, um, in his PC research in uh, physiology, um, uh, looking at uh, the fluid dynamics of heart valves. Typically, with those kinds, and then there are a lot of other methods that are also called immersed boundary methods. There's, it's, it's sort of not a totally well-defined class of, of methods. But um, for the kinds of immersed boundary methods I'm going to be talking about, um, typically, you have a common momentum equation that you use for both the fluid and the structure. And I'll think I'll, I'll, I'll aim to make this more clear a little bit later on. Um, coupling is through integral transforms with direct delta function kernels. Um, what's nice about these approaches is that um, because the interface geometry is not constrained to conform to the um, fluid geometry, um, you can solve the fluid equations using fast structure grid solvers. So you've got Cartesian grid equations. Um, uh, they don't use body conforming discretizations. Um, and these methods don't suffer from added mass effect instabilities. Um, so, so they very naturally handle neutrally buoyant cases, for instance. Challenges include that, so they can lead 
to low accuracy right at the fluid structure interface, which is maybe where you would want to have high accuracy. So there's some trade-offs there. And then um, because the more conventional formulations use a common momentum equation for the fluid and the structure, if you have different time scales for the dynamics of the fluid and the structure, it can be hard to um, efficiently deal with the disparity, disparate time, time scale. So you usually use kind of monolithic time stepping. So, so you, some you you can. Um, so, if you sort of relax some of the constraints in terms of how the mesh conforms along the fluid structure interface, you can start to do things where you advance the structure separately from the fluid, and you can imagine using different time steps for those. Yeah, um, but um, but you still have to deal. With, but then at that point, you have to deal with kind of non-conforming discretization along the. It, it's a conforming. It's geometrically conforming, but non-conforming meshes, and that that creates some complications as well. And using different time step sizes, when you have this conforming sort of description of the um, fluid structure system, is is one of the sources of these artificial added mass effect instabilities. And so, if you have sort of like a structure that kind of moves into a region where there used to be fluid, or vice versa, that can lead to instabilities if things aren't handled properly. So. So, so, so some of the some of the some of the things that you get from these partition formulations are also the causes of some of your challenges. All right. So, um, so kind of my I, I'm going to tell you a few different things about immersed boundary methods. Kind of the high level kind of thesis statement here is that immersed boundary methods or the immersed boundary method it gives us kind of a framework for building different kinds of multi physics fluid structure interaction models. And so, talk is broken up into four parts. So part one, I'm going to give a high level um, introduction to immersed boundary and related kind of method called immersed interface methods, um, focusing on interface method, uh, interface problems, so thin interfaces. Um, and then I'm going to spend a chunk of time talking about how to make immersed boundary type methods efficient for cases where you have volumetric elastic structures. And so those are the methods that were used for the simulations that I was visualizing on the title slide. Um, then depending on how fast I go, I'll tell you about how to model uh, material failure using a, um, using a non-local description of uh, continuum mechanics called peridynamics. And then at the end, I'll say a few words about how to, tr how to try to get the best of both worlds. All right, so let's start just with immersed boundary Method. So this is very much in the style of methods that were um, really pioneered by Peskin. Um, so the general setup, we've got a structure. For right now, it's a thin interface, but it could be a volumetric structure that's immersed in a viscous incompressible fluid. It immersed means there's fluid on the outside and the inside. Um, there's fluid everywhere. We're going to describe the fluid using um, fixed physical coordinates. So, so we're going to describe it in terms of uh, fixed coordinates, say x1, x2, x3. Um, in terms of the Eulerian fluid velocity, Eulerian pressure, and there'll be an Eulerian body force density that I'll define in a minute. Uh, we're going to describe the configuration of the structure uh, using a curvilinear coordinates that are attached to the structure. So like for a thin interface, these you could think of as being curvilinear coordinates. For a volumetric structure, maybe they're reference coordinates um, or initial coordinates that describe uh, the um, configuration of the structure at time zero. We're going to keep track of the current physical position of every material point. Um, we're going to keep track of resultant forces that are generated by deformations of the uh, of the structure. And then um, a, a, a region that's going to show up a, a few different times is the boundary of the domain uh, of, of the inner of, of the fluid structure interface is gamma, and it's going to move around. So the basic immersed boundary equations are the uh, Eulerian viscous incompressible Navier-Stokes equations um, augmented by a body force density. Um, the body force density, this is an Eulerian force density uh, with respect to the, uh, so it's a volumetric force density that we get from a Lagrangian description of forces along the interface. This is force per unit, well, per unit Q, whatever your curvilinear coordinate space is. But so this is like force per unit area, um, uh, for, uh, for, for, a, for a thin interface in 3D. So, so this integral transform is converting this Lagrangian description of forces on the interface to an Eulerian description of forces that, um, that we're going to plug in as the right-hand side of uh, the Navier-Stokes equations. And then we're going to read off the velocity 
um, at the interface. That's what this delta function is going to do in order to determine the motion of the interface. And um, the velocity is continuous. And so you could just say, well, this is the same thing as evaluating the velocity at a particular material point. But when it comes to discretizing the equations, there's an advantage to keeping this delta function transform uh, uh, formulation for determining the motion of the interface. So the basic discretization, I'm not going to talk a lot about discretization stuff for right now, but basic discretization is we've got a Cartesian grid for the Eulerian equations. We've got some kind of material uh, 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 aligned uh, discretization for the interface. And we're going to um, replace the delta functions with regularized delta functions. So this is going to sort of smear forces out. And um, there are many, many, many recipes that people use to construct regularized delta functions. But you want to think of them, well, we, people typically think of them as sort of concentrating forces near the interface. Um, a construction that I like, because you can, you can graphically show it pretty easily, is uh, construction for delta functions that use uh, cardinal B splines. So cardinal B splines are, um, are, are um, you know, it's, it's the same kind of curves that show up for NURBS. Um, you can get them by starting with the window function. So window function is piecewise constant function that integrates to one. And if you can involve the window function with itself, you get a first order cardinal B spline, which is the hat function. And so then you can just do this in a recursive way. So if you take your first order B spline and convolve it with the window function, you get a second order B spline. Every time you do this, you get more continuity. Um, so, so the initial one is discontinuous. This is continuous, but not continuously differentiable. This guy is continuously differentiable, and you can keep on going. Every time you convolve, the thing smears out a little bit more. And so you have to balance how, you know, how concentrated do you want things, how smooth do you want things. But this procedure, if you renormalize, um, eventually converges to a Gaussian. Yes? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 so these, so these functions all satisfy um, uh, sort of a zeroth and first order discrete moment condition. So force is conserved and torque is conserved. Um, the higher order functions don't necessarily give you higher order discrete moment conditions. Um, and so if you really want higher discrete moment conditions, you have to use a different um, construction. Uh, Charlie Peskin has a construction that uses discrete moment conditions to build these functions. You get broader and broader and broader functions. We have done a lot of numerical tests with them, and I've never found a case where, at least in our, in, for our use cases, we don't get any benefit from having higher order moment conditions. That, if anything, it makes things worse. Um, yes. Is It, 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 yeah, so it doesn't change the convergence rate, but it changes the constant, and it makes the constant bigger instead of smaller. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yep, that's right. Yeah, so it, I do. I, I think I, I think I might have dropped that slide. Um, but yeah, so these are on Cartesian grids. These are tensor product things. Yes. So radial, radial functions, people have looked at them. And um, if you use radial functions on Cartesian grids, you don't get, it doesn't work as well as using tensor product ones. So there's, a, there's a, at least one paper by um, Anna Karen Tornberg where they looked at these, something not exactly the same kind of methods, but radial functions did not give you, they didn't work as well as tensor product. And you know, tensor product of Gaussian is, is radial. So in, it, like if you think of it like, I'm trying to approximate a Gaussian, it's not totally crazy to use a tensor product. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So in practice, we use tensor product here. All right. So like just at a high level, how did the how did the how does the method work? We're gonna compute forces on the boundary using some kind of constitutive model, and then we're gonna take our regularized delta functions and we're gonna sort of smear the forces out onto the background grid using whatever whatever regularized delta function you like. Um, that gives us a force field on the background grid that is just treated as a forcing for solving a discretization of the incompressible and Navier-Stokes equations. That gives us a new velocity field that we're then going to sample here using exactly the same kernel functions uh, to determine the motion of the structure. And so um, one of the things that you get out of keeping this integral transform or discretized integral transform for determining the velocity of the structure is that if you think of the um, operators that are connecting forces and velocities, they're adjoints. And so at least the semi-discretized equation, so discrete in space but not in time, um, uh, there's no, uh, uh, you get a conservation of energy um, in the coupling. 
so 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 energy is neither created or destroyed in the coupling scheme. Um, of course, the equations themselves are dissipative, so you don't have overall conservation of energy. Yes, this is just for order of time step in. In practice, we in practice, I use something that's not a lot more complicated than this. Um, um, I like to use um, uh, something that's basically like an explicit midpoint rule, um, and so I can talk you through it real quick. Um, it's second order of time. So, you, so you, yeah. So, so, so what you do is you sample the velocity at the beginning. You advance to the middle of the time step. Use that to compute forces. Spread it out, and then you go back and reinterpolate to get second order of time. So it's not that much more complicated. So, how does the energy conservation? As soon as you discretize in time, you um, need to uh, treat at least certain terms implicitly to maintain uh, conservation of energy. Uh, so, no. Um, and the reason is that I don't know how to efficiently solve the resulting systems of equations. It's not super important to exactly. Well, so, so right. So the whole system is dissipative because of viscosity. Um, um, so is it important? I think that depends a lot on what you're interested in getting out of the, uh, getting out of the models. Um, and um, I mean, in some sense, there's a, um, uh, it's 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 it, it thanks think, so there's going to be something like a time step size restriction and as long as you're below that time step size restriction you you get the right kind of energy dissipation which is again driven by viscosity here um, and if you exceed that then you know things blow up yeah all right um, and so I'm not going to use it a lot but it's kind of the, the way that I think about it is that we have some matrix that give, that goes from forces on the boundary to forces on the background grid and then it's Kind of rescale transpose goes from velocities on the grid back to the uh, motion of the interface. So those are those immersed boundary methods. Um, so for interface problems, when you have a force that's applied on an infinitesimally thin interface, that gives rise to jumps in the fluid stress along that interface. Um, and so that just that's just a consequence of force balance. Um, and so in particular, the, uh, the normal for, for a viscous incompressible fluid, the normal part of the force gives you a jump in the pressure. And the, um, uh, the tangential part of the force gives you a jump in the, um, in the viscous stress, or you can think of it as the, uh, just the velocity gradient across the interface. Um, and numerical methods that sort of directly build these jump conditions into the equations of motion are um, uh, are often called immersed, inter uh, immersed interface methods. So immersed interface methods were introduced by, uh, by Randy Lebeck and Jilin Lee in the 90s um, and um, have mostly been used kind of, in, kind of by mathematicians. I would say they've had relatively limited impact in engineering practice. Um, uh, but, um, uh, but so what you do is you, you try to build these jump conditions and directly into the equations of motion. Um, so how do you do that when you have a discrete description of the velocity field and of the, and of the pressure field. So um, the approach that we use is an approach that I think was initially popularized in the, in the aughts, maybe the 2000s. Um, and um, it uses an approach based on what are called generalized Taylor expansion. So if you have a function and it's smooth everywhere except for at some selected locations and you have jump conditions at selected locations and you know where the jump conditions are and you know what they are then you can do a taylor expansion that includes the regular parts of the taylor series along with terms that involve these known jump conditions in the function and its derivatives so if you know those discontinuities you know what they are and you know where they are you can construct accurate approximations to derivatives of these discontinuous functions. Um, and what's nice, at least for the, uh, at least for viscous incompressible fluids, is that you get a term that looks like just a regular old um, finite difference approximation. And then you get a term that involves the jump conditions, but it doesn't involve the unknown field that you're trying to solve for. And so this is just an inhomogeneous term that you can move over onto the right-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equations is just a forcing. And it's a forcing that depends on where the boundary is and what the forces are that are applied along the interface. And so, um, so you need to figure out where finite difference stencils. This is kind of a cluttered figure, but this is showing, you know, for a staggered 
grid discretization of the incompressible dynamic surface equations, so velocities are on the sides of the cells and pressures are at the cell centers. You need to be able to compute pressure gradients. Pressure gradients involve differences of pressures. And so whenever those stencils cut an interface, you need to figure out where the cut is, what the forces are on the interface, and then you can use those to figure out the jump conditions. And then you just build those into the, uh, uh, you, you, you move those over to the right-hand side. And then similarly for um, the types, types of Laplace, Laplace and stencils that show up for the viscous terms. You've got to figure out where these, say, five-point stencils cut the boundary and evaluate the appropriate forces there. Um, but at the end of the day, you just have some operator. It's a more maybe more complicated operator um, that goes from forces on the boundary to forces on the background grid. And there's a similar operator that goes from velocities back on the grid back to velocities of the structure. Um, and so the, the thing that you get out of this is that you can still use just a regular Cartesian grid fluid solver. The fluid solver doesn't need to know anything about where the interface is. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, I didn't say, you missed it because I didn't say it. Um, so, so, so right. So, so in, in all the computations I'm going to show you, um, we're just keeping, we're, we're going to use like a triangulated surface to describe where the interface is. Mm -hmm. And you have its vertices and yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And so then you have to do basically like ray tracing to figure out where do the finite difference stencils cut through the, um, the facets of like your triangulated surface. Um, and, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not going to get into this, but some of the difficulties in using these methods in practice come from the fact that now you've got like a you've got a C zero but not C one discretization of the a description of your interface, and bad things can happen at corners. Um, I'm going to show you examples where bad things don't happen at corners. But, um, okay. Um, okay. So so a couple of test cases. I might zoom through these because I'm going a little bit more slowly than I was expecting. So. Um, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna skip. So this is. I like this one. So so this is a test that um, Thomas uh, Fay and Chris Rycroft uh, developed in the context of a of a of a version of the immersed boundary method. It's a uh, um, eccentric rotating cylinders. There's an asymptotically exact solution for what goes on in the gap between these two um, rotating cylinders, and um, we uh, in and you can look at the. Um, the velocity, so the interesting velocity is the um, uh, vertical velocity component in the gap. Um, and so we're looking at the velocity, the vertical velocity along this line that goes through the middle of this pair of, uh, this pair of rotating cylinders. The asymptotically exact solution is this black curve. Um, what you get if you use an immersed boundary method, if you only have half a mesh width to cover that gap, is this very kind of this, this curve, which is very far away from the, from the exact solution. And if you have half a mesh width for this immersed interface method, you get something that's pretty close. It's not exactly right. Something bad happens because you're trying to impose jump conditions within the same stencil. Um, but then um, as soon as you have like a grid cell or two between the, in the gap, the um, immersed interface discretization captures the asymptotically exact solution almost perfectly. Immersed boundary method still has some difficulties. Eventually, if you do grid refinement, the gap becomes many grid cells wide, and then you get an accurate solution with both of the methods. But if you want to have kind of a minimal resolution between the gap, you do better with this kind of jump condition-based approach. Except the flow is very uh, simple. It's like almost a linear. Yeah, that's that's yeah yeah that's right that's right that's right that's right um, and sort of I I can tell you what the why bad things happen with the immersed boundary method but maybe we can postpone that for for later um, so okay and then this is looking at the pressures pressures are very accurate for this immersed interface method they're they're much less so for the regular immersed boundary method so so Faye and Raycroft developed a improved version of the immersed boundary method that does a much better job for this problem, but it's pretty specialized. It's, it's not so obvious how to, how to generalize it. So an, another test problem, I use it too much, is flow past the cylinder. So um, this is flow past the cylinder, Reynolds number 200, I think, um, uh, plotting the um, uh, uh, vortex shedding. Um, and so this is an immersed boundary model. Um, we're, the immersed boundary model is keeping the configuration of the boundary fixed in place. Um, and um, there's fluid on the inside and there's fluid on the outside. And because there is external flow, there has to be a counterbalancing internal flow here. And so you get sort of these internal flows that you may or may not like. I don't like them, but, um, um, but you, I mean, the, you get the right external flow. 
right? You get the right external flow. Um, so, but if you do the same problem with these immersive interface methods, you get sort of this, essentially no flow on the inside. So it's like there's this huge difference um, in the quality of the solutions at the same spatial resolution. Okay. All right. So that took longer than I should. But I, I don't know. So it's, that's immersive boundary methods. Um, what are they good for? They're good for avoiding body conforming discretizations. They accomplish that by using regularized delta functions. Modern immersed interface methods can handle interface problems with fully discrete geometries. Um, thanks for the question. Um, and then I'll show you some more examples of this at the end of the talk. Um, these do yield accurate fluid stresses all the way up to the interface. And um, like regular immersed boundary methods, and unlike most cut cell methods, they actually solve the equations of fluid dynamics on both sides of the interface. That may or may not be what you want, but there's some good things that happen when you do this. Um, and um, I didn't say anything about this, but um, we're not imposing very many jump conditions. And even if you don't impose very many jump conditions, you can still do a very good job of improving the accuracy. Um, when things are very close together, we need to be more careful. This is something that we're actively working on. OK. All right, so, so let me tell you about elastic structures. Um, so for elastic bodies, we want to use more or less the same thing. So this is going to be immersed boundary, not immersed interface. Um, and so what's the, what's the material that we're modeling here? So the material that we're going to be modeling, ultimately, we're going to solve the Navier-Stokes equations everywhere in the computational domain. In part of the domain, there's also going to be an elastic structure. And so what we have is a model of the material that's sort of like a superposition of a viscous incompressible fluid and an elastic structure that's within the structural region. But then the fluid region is just the regular um, stress tensor for a viscous incompressible fluid, um, we're going to be describing the um, elasticity of the structure in terms of uh, first Biela Kirchhoff stress tensor um, for a hyperelastic material. So you've got some kind of hyperelastic energy functional. That stress is the derivative of the energy functional with respect to this quantity called the deformation gradient tensor. Um, and then J is going to show up a lot. J is the, uh, is the determinant of the deformation gradient tensor for an incompressible material that should, it should just always be one. So, so the equations of motion are almost the same. It's just the way that we compute forces that's different. So there's a, there's a, re, there's a resultant force from the uh, divergence of the stress that's distributed throughout the interior of the body. And then um, it turns out that there also has to be an extra traction-like force that is only applied along the fluid structure interface. And so there's a singular force layer, kind of like what shows up in a regular immersed boundary method. And you can show that this has to be there for, uh, to, for force balance to work out correctly. In practice, we actually use a weak form where we get rid of that boundary term so that you have a regular kind of uh, weak form of the divergence of the stress um, that gives us a force field that is applied not at the boundary, but throughout the body. So this force is, is, is applied at all of the material points that make up the structure. And then as in the regular immersed boundary method, we're going to sample the velocity to tell us how the boundary points move. And so one of the things to notice about this formulation is that um, the velocity field is uh, required to be incompressible. We're using that velocity field to move the structure. And so a thing that many people have done is to discretize these equations and sort of assume that everything, that, that, you, that things are incompressible. So they use an incompressible elasticity formula. Um, well, so, 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 so it, it, it's, actually, it's, it's actually hard to not treat the material as, it, it's, it's hard to not treat the material in the continuum frame as being incompressible because you're using, you're using this velocity field. This velocity field is defined everywhere, right? And it's incompressible everywhere. And so if you're using that to move the structure, the structure is automatically incompressible. Um, but um, it's a mistake to rely on that. Um, so, so, so if you rely on that, you say, OK, I'm going to simulate. This is a twisting beam problem. The, so I'm plotting the Jacobian determinant. So it should stay 1. I'm going to twist it. Um, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm going to treat it like it's an exactly incompressible material. Um, and um, I twist it, and bad things happen. So it shrinks. Um, uh, there's, there's really weird, crinkly deformations. Um, the results are very bad. And so every, you know, every now and then, I run into somebody who's like, oh, immersed boundary method doesn't work. And it's like, well, why doesn't it work? So I, do, I do this, and you know, I get bad results. So, so, so no, I don't remesh. I don't remesh. But remeshing wouldn't help. Remeshing would not help. It wouldn't help. It wouldn't help. Um, 
And and the reason is that, it, the, the, well, the, the, the fundamental reason is that standard velocity interpolation doesn't guarantee incompressibility. It just doesn't. Um, and um, so th there are a few things that you could try to do. What we typically do in practice is, is, is two things, and I'll show you their effect one at a time. One is we add an extra energy that penalizes um, volume change. And so we treat it not like an incompressible material, but like a nearly incompressible material. Um, and so then when we do that, we get much better deformations, um, but it's still not preserving volume. And so then the other thing that we do is we use what's called a modified deformation gradient sensor to evaluate the shearing part of the force. So, so this is your this is the this is the part of the elasticity model that's really modeling the material. Um, and we plug in a, uh, a a version of the deformation gradient sensor that only encodes shearing motions and that does not encode any volume changes. This is a very standard technique for um, nearly incompressible elasticity that's used in kind of like engineering finite element codes. So it's just using, we're just gonna treat it not like an incompressible material, but like a nearly incompressible material. And lo and behold, everything works. So, um, so what does that mean everything works? So here, this is looking at the tip displacement for this twisting beam problem as a function of the number of um, elements and comparing um, that to a standard finite element method for exactly incompressible large deformation elasticity. So, so, so what's the moral of the story here? Moral of the story is that um, um, you can get very bad results if you're not careful. Um, and you can get, I would say, very good results if you are. Um, so you should be careful. Um, um, so, uh, the, so if you're, if you're, yeah, so you, you could couple everything with a compressible fluid solver, um, and, um, and then you can have a compressible material. It gets a little bit hard to understand exactly what the constitutive model is there, because then you, you have sort of two different ways that you're accounting for the compressibility. One is through the fluid and one is through whatever the constitutive model is for the structure. Um, you could do it. I, I don't, so, so usually what people, usually, there's not a lot of work on this, but when people try to model compressible structures in this context, they typically try to keep the fluid incompressible and just make the structure compressible in some way. And, there, and there's some work on this. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, making it compressible, right? So you, you have to worry about like sound waves and stuff like that. Um, uh, there, there, there are people that use compressible fluid dynamics to do like heart valves, and it sounds harder than using incompressible fluid dynamics. All right, okay. Um, so just a couple of examples. So, so Laura Miller, who used to be at, well, so who who went to graduate school with Danny and Silas and me and other people. Um, uh, uh, and who used to be at UNC has used these codes and methods to, to do these really cool simulations of jellyfish. So this is looking at a jellyfish um, uh, bell and uh, along with the vorticity on a plane that's bisecting the bell. And so they use, the, they use these kind of solvers to, um, to look at the effect of, um, uh, for instance, changing the elasticity of the bell. And so you can show that if the um, if the jellyfish bell is pumping at the resonant frequency, it's sort of swimming in the most efficient way, um, and they also they, so this I think is really cool. So here they're looking at um, they're looking at a case where they have activation wave going from right to left, and they're modulating the timing of that wave. And so when it's very slow, the thing swims up, um, and when it's very fast, it's as if it's it's, it's as if it's contracting synchronously and it swims right up. But there's an intermediate regime where it where it rotates, and um, um, so there's this interesting nonlinear relationship, non-monotonic relationship between the angular velocity and the activation timing. Yeah. So um, I think I think this. So I wasn't involved in this, but I think this appeared in PNAS like last year or something like that. Um, all right. So let let me tell you a little bit about some of the details of the numerics here. Um, well. Maybe, maybe actually, I'm not going to tell you the details of the numerics. I'm going to skip this. If anybody wants the details of some of the numerics, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards. But I want to show a little bit more of other numerics um, and a little bit more examples of computation. So, 
Um, we use these methods to do cardiovascular fluid dynamics. And um, we've been working on both models of in vitro systems. So this is a tabletop heart simulator. It's, a, it's called a pulse duplicator. So it's a closed loop system. You can't really see it very well in this, in this movie. But so there's a, there's a piston pump that sits behind a chamber that has a flexible bag in it. The flexible bag acts like the heart. Um, and the chamber expands and contracts. And when it contracts, it pushes blood, or not blood, it pushes test fluid out through um, the aortic valve test section of this uh, pulse duplicator. When it expands, it pulls test fluid in through a mitral valve um, or, or, or a model of the mitral valve. And you can tune up the um, uh, resistances and compliances to mimic the operating conditions that a real valve would experience. Um, we've used uh, these kinds of numerical methods to look at um, um, models of, of prosthetic heart valves. This is an example of a, uh, of a prosthetic heart valve that's made of bovine pericardium. Um, there are uh, tensile test data that you can use to parameterize hyperelastic material models that do a good job of capturing the kind of the gross response of these kinds of materials. Um, and then um, what we've what we've done is we've we've done matching simulations and experiments where we use pressure and flow data downstream of the valve to calibrate a reduced order model. So just a zero D kind of circuit model. This is what's called a Windkessel model. Um, and we use pressure and flow data upstream of the, of the test section to calibrate a similar reduced order model of the system components upstream. So it's like a, there's a pump and there's some resistances and there's some compliances. And uh, so we calibrate these independently of the FSI model. Yes. Yeah, so, so this here, this corresponds to a case where um, the test fluid is, is sailing. And um, and uh, at kind of normal cardiac output, Reynolds number is about twenty thousand. Um, for, for if it was blood, blood's about four times. Blood is thicker than water. Blood is like four, the viscosity is four times water. Uh, Reynolds number is like five thousand, six thousand, something like that. But th in this particular case, it's about twenty thousand. Is it? This is DNA. Well, is it? So um, so we use uh, we use um, um, we use uh, things that look like piecewise parabolic method for the convective term, so sort of high resolution um, upwind schemes. And so you could argue that that's giving you something like a so-called implicit LES uh, kind of turbulence model. Um, whether it's a good turbulence model or not, I'm, I'm, I'm not the right person to answer. But, um, so, so, it, so, we, so we have an upstream model, reduced order model that we've calibrated. We've got a downstream model that we've calibrated. We don't calibrate it all together, OK? And then we plug it in, and, and we ask, do we do a good job of capturing the overall system dynamics? It's not a trivial question, because it all depends on whether the valves open and close correctly and things like that. And so if you look at a comparison between flow rates, flow rates are in, I would say, very good, not perfect, but in very good agreement. Um, so this is comparing the, the simulation as a solid curve, the experiments, the dash curve. Um, um, this is looking at pressures. This is the driving pressure, sort of the left ventricular pressure. Um, is this lower curve? This is the downstream curve. Is like the aortic pressure. They're in very good agreement. Um, and in particular, the closed valve supports a realistic pressure load without leaking. So we've done this for the whole heart. I'm going to zoom through this because I want to tell you something about some other numerical methods. But so 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 we have a, a heart model. It's a, it uses CT images. It's CT image derived anatomy. Uh, for the chamber walls, uh, we can't see the valve leaflets clearly in the images that we have. This is for a healthy human subject. Um, so we have uh, sort of mathematical uh, uh, models of the anatomy of the valve leaflets and the valve apparatuses. We have, a, we, we, we have one big tetrahedral mesh that captures all of the geometry. Um, and so, this is, so it's, it's one monolithic mesh with all of these structures in it. Um, this uses a, 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 a open source package called TetWild. So if you ever need to mesh something really complicated, TetWild is worth checking out. Um, and um, just really quickly, so, so what does it do? Well, so the heart beats. Uh, but so this is a full fluid structure interaction model. So all of the motions are determined by um, equations of elastodynamics um, and a description of active muscle contraction, which I'm not telling you about um, right now. Again, happy to talk about how we model contraction offline. Yep. Oh, that's a question, but what did you 
Take. Yeah. So so we run these on these. We run them on kind of like a BP server, just but sort of like you know like it's two AMD Epic chips. Right now it takes too long. It takes it takes takes about ten days per cycle um, with the code that was used for this. Um, I just got new timings for a new version of the code last night um, as I was trying to get here, um, and uh, I, I, we have a new version that, that's at least three times faster. Um, and um, and the person that's working on improving performance is like, there's lots of room for improvement. We'll see, but um, but yeah, but even still, you know, so we're talking about like a couple days per cycle. Um, but but on moderate modest computational resources. Yeah. Um, this is pressures. I'm going to skip that. This is flows, velocities, and vorticity going through the mitral valve and the aortic valve. So mitral valve is the inflow valve on the left side of the heart. Aortic valve is the outflow valve on the on the left side of the heart. These are volumetric flow rates through this inflow valve, the mitral valve. So there's an initial passive filling and then an active filling when the upper chamber contracts. So this well, so there is definitely a closure transient. And then you can see that the valve bulges back. And that is exactly this part of the flow rate waveform. Um, so, so this valve suffers from mild um, uh, 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 prolapse. Um, and, and, and actually, we didn't, we didn't know this until later. So, so the, the papillary muscles, which are the muscles that these cords attach to, are pretty low. They're quite apical. They're supposed to correspond to where they are in the in the patient data. So, like, do they? I don't. I, I haven't checked it myself. But it turns out that patients that have apical papillary muscles tend to suffer from mitral valve prolapse. Um, well, it wasn't intended, but it's consistent with what happens in real patients. And then you also have LP valves. Well, so we're working on that. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty healthy. This is very typical. Almost everybody has a little bit of, of valve dysfunction. It's very common. Um, this is a comparison of flow rate waveforms through the mitral valve to dog data. Do they have exactly the same kind of um, uh, some, same kind of closure transients um, as what we see in the simulation. Um, this, I think this is a pretty good um, comparison. And, and the data here come from Ed Yellen. Ed Yellen was Charlie Peskin's PhD advisor um, at, uh, um, at Yeshiva. This is the aortic valve, same story for volumetric flow rate. Um, um, this is a comparison between simulation, and then this is clinical data from people. And so you see exactly the same kind of qualitative features. There's a little bit of regurgitation, um, but the characteristic shapes, I think, are in really good agreement. And, 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 and there's, I would say there's very little calibration that's gone into trying to tune up these shapes. The shapes kind of emerge from getting the rest of the dynamics right. All right. Um, and then you can use the models to look at things like, well, how should you model active contraction? So you get different results for different cases. Um, um, and um, we're working on adding in electrophysiology. So this is, I think we'll be, I think we'll have this working at the end of the summer, I hope. So, so the active muscle contraction right now is just being imposed. The, top, the upper chambers contract, the lower chambers contract. Um, but um, Really, in a real heart, they're driven by electrophysiology, and we're pretty close to having a full electrophysiology model. Yeah, so the equations that we're using here are what are called the monodomain equations. They're, a react, they're reaction diffusion equations. So, it's, so they're not like wave equations. So it's a nonlinear uh, um, mechanism that gives rise to the waves. A more complicated version of them are called the bidomain equations. So bidomain equations are equations that you would use to model things like um, uh, um, uh, uh, like paddle electrodes for trying to resuscitate somebody who's had a heart attack. Um, all right, so we have methods that work well for um, large deformation and elasticity. And if you set them up correctly, I think I think it's I think it's fair to say that you get accuracy that's comparable to conventional sort of like low order finite element methods. And um, I think in kind of trying to move these kinds of methods into practice, I think that's fine. I think that's fine. Um, I didn't tell you about the second point, so I'm not going to tell you about it now either. All right. And then I'm going to totally skip this. You can tell that I'm very ambitious about the number of slides I can get through. Um, but you can use this to model material failure. All right. So this is using paradynamics. Happy to talk about that later. Um, OK. So I want to tell you, at least at a high level, of an approach that we've been developing to try to bridge these two conventional, quote unquote, conventional approaches to fluid structure interaction. Um, and so it's a FSI scheme that's based on the immersed interface method. So, so first, 
what are the equations that a body conforming in discretization would solve? So, so, so this is a more typical framework for doing fluid structure interaction. You've got a fluid region, it's omega f. You've got a fluid region. And in omega f, you solve the fluid equations. And you've got a solid region, omega s. And in the solid region, you solve the solid equations. And then you have um, interface conditions. So you have the no-slip condition. So here, C is the motion of the structure. So if you evaluate the fluid velocity where the structure is, it should match the structure velocity. So that's along the fluid structure interface. And then we've got force balance. So you've got traction matching conditions. The structural traction should match the fluid traction. You have to worry about change of area, whatever. It's sort of, there's some conversion factors to get everything in the right frame. But basically, this says that the solid traction matches the fluid traction. So th these, are the, these are like the standard equations that you might want to solve for doing fluid structure interaction with a, with a body fitted method. So in an immersed method, what we're going to do is we're going to now solve the fluid equations everywhere in the domain. So we solve the fluid equations of the fluid region. We solve the sol fluid equations of the solid region. But we don't want the fluid velocities or stresses in the, sol in the solid region to impact the dynamics. And so the way that we do that is by introducing a Lagrange multiplier that imposes the constraint that the fluid and the solid move together along the fluid solid interface. And so this is this is exactly an interfacial force, just like in an immersed boundary method. Um, the difference, though, is that we're going to drive the motion of the structure not by interpolating the velocity field, but by, um, by reading off fluid stresses. Um, so that's the basic continuum equations. When we go to discretize things, we, we don't like solving saddle point systems that you would have to solve to get the Lagrange multiplier. And so we use a penalty formulation. And the way the penalty formulation works is that we use fluid forces to drive the motion of the structure. So we read off fluid tractions to drive the motion of the structure. The structure goes wherever it goes. And then there is a restoring force that acts to keep an interface that moves with the fluid close to the boundary of the structure. So this black interface moves according to the interpolated fluid velocity. The red region moves according to the equation of elastodynamics. The motion of the red region is driven by the fluid tractions. Wherever this boundary goes, it pulls the fluid with it. And so we're sort of weakly imposing the no-slip condition. Um, and I'm going to skip the equations, because I, I think just saying it in words is maybe is about as good. Um, so how does it work? So this is for rigid body dynamics. This is a this is like a you could this is sort of like you drop a piece of paper and it's fluttering down. So it's a fluttering plate kind of model. Um, and uh, Jane Wang, who's at Cornell, who's done a lot of work with immersed interface methods, um, did they th their group did some experiments where um, uh, uh, they 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 had these kind of fluttering plates. And um, I would say we get good agreement, not perfect agreement, but pretty good agreement with um, with these experimental data. I'm not sure that we're capturing all the experimental conditions. If you change the angle of attack just a little bit, it goes from fluttering to tumbling. And, um, and then if you look at the trajectories there, I would say, if anything, it's, in, it's better. Um, so this is a case that's hard for body conforming methods to handle. So this is a very light sphere in a water column. And so when the sphere, it, so it's, it rises, once it reaches a critical uh, Reynolds number, it starts vortex shedding, and then the thing heaves back and forth. Um, it's in a it's in a it's in a square duct, and that duct picks out a heaving direction. And so the direction of heaving is aligned with the axis of the square duct. And again, there's some experimental data, um, in this case from Horowitz and Williamson, um, that we're in good agreement with. Now there's a free surface in the real thing that we're not modeling. So eventually, as it gets closer, you're gonna get worse agreement. But yes. So. These are 2D. Okay. These are 3D. These are 3D, yeah. Um, so those are rigid body cases. Um, you can use elastodynamics to determine the structure. This is a test problem that people have used um, of just a flexible kind of circular body and a lid-driven cavity flow. Um, and one of the things that you might worry about is we've got two representations of the fluid structure interface, one that's attached to the structure and one that's attached to the fluid. Can we control how far apart those are? And the answer is yes. So, so we can use the 
um, un, at least under grid refinement, um, those two those two representations converge to each other, and it turns out we use a penalty method. So, so there's a spring that's this restoring force to keep them close together. The dynamics that you get are pretty insensitive to the details of how you set up that restoring force, as long as it does a good enough job of keeping the two interfaces close together. Um, this is this benchmark that I mentioned way back at the beginning of the talk. So this is sort of a 2D flapping flag problem that, uh, again, is pretty popular for looking at um, uh, uh, FSI methods. It's 2D. Um, and the original version of this is from a uh, paper by Trek and Ron. Um, they're looking at the, um, uh, the, the, sorry, this is the displacement, not velocity, of the tip. And uh, you get numbers that are around like 0.12. That's what they see. That's what we see. So um, results for this kind of formulation are in, I think, very good agreement with the literature. There's not, I mean, so the literature values, there's a lot of uh, sort of scatter in those values. But um, we're definitely well within the mainstream for these kinds of things. Um, this is a, this is a, a, a 3D test um, looking at a flexible plate um, that um, I think David uh, Nordsleton uh, was involved in this. Uh, work and um, uh, they had a, a, a phantom where they got some uh, imaging data of this deflections of a, of a flexible um, kind of beam. So this is a three D thing in this slightly complicated domain. You've got two two cylinders coming in, one cylinder coming out, um, and results are in good agreement. And so I'm going to end with 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 a challenge that we're facing. So a nice thing about immersed boundary methods is that they kind of handle contact automatically. And you might hope that that also happens here. And so to do that, this is like flow through. This is like a flexible thing going through a nozzle. So we're driving it through the nozzle. And so if you watch what happens, then I don't know if you see it. It, it all right. It penetrates. It penetrates. So you can control penetration in part. Like if you just resolve the boundary layer, then it won't penetrate. So you're like, I'm gonna make it finer, but like you can never resolve. Um, so you can tighten up the penalty parameters. Tightening up the penalty parameters helps a little bit. If you look, I'm like, oh, it's almost there. It overlaps a little bit. And so finally, you say, OK, I'm going to give in. I'm going to put in a contact model. So you put in a contact model, and now it can go through. It means you have to do a contact model. A thing I didn't mention, maybe I did, is that with immersed boundary methods, you don't have to put in a contact model. There's an implicit contact model. Um, and so that's great unless you don't like the contact model that the immersed boundary method gives you, in which case it's terrible, because there's sort of nothing you can do about it. So here, you have to do a contact model, so that kind of sucks. But um, you get to do a contact model that corresponds to whatever um, the situation is that you're trying to model. And so that's good. Um, and so here, this is just a slow-mo showing you that, yeah, it really does prevent penetration. OK. We've used we actually developed this originally in a collaboration with the Food and Drug Administration, where we're trying to model clot capturing in these uh, devices called inferior vena cava filters. I'm going to show you a movie, and I'm going to stop talking because I'm over time. So. All right, so I'm just going to put up some conclusions, and I'm happy to take any more questions. If I what? Well, thank you very much. Thank you. If I recall well, uh, the velocity going inside. Yes, yes, yes. I guess this is because you have a gauge telescope. You're still getting negative velocity. No, no. So, 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 this is a great question. So, um, I've got flow past the cylinder, I've got flow coming in. The flow coming in clearly goes around, right? Um, clearly goes around. So then, so then, what I want at the end of the day, if I've got a material point that I'm describing using my immersed boundary method, um, I, I want that material point not to go anywhere. So, so when I sample the velocity using my regularized delta function, I want that sampled velocity to be zero. And I set up forces to make sure that that happens. So there are forces that are set up to ensure that whatever the flow is, when I sample it here, it's zero. Okay. So 
I've got, I've got in general, you know, in general, there's going to be some, I mean, there's a boundary layer, so it's going to taper off, but like there's going to be some non-zero flow here. And I'm averaging my local flow in a way using my regularized delta function. And I want it to average to zero. And so for it to average to zero, there has to be another flow inside. That's, that's the counter flow. Um, so the other way that you could have it is you could set it up so that you have zero flow everywhere. And if you have zero flow everywhere, then you don't get this, but it means that you push your boundary layer further away. Does that make sense? But I'm not from math, but I'm engineering, and I'm working a whole model of values. Okay, great. Fabulous. And coming from boundary layer. Right. Yep. 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 For a non non-conforming yep. that is non conforming Yep. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so so one of so so so, so that's a great question. Um, so um, it so if 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 it it's so so a thing that you can do, and um, so there's work by Basilevs and Hughes from the from two thousand. I think the paper's from two thousand and eight, where they're like, we're gonna like weakly impose boundary conditions for turbulent channel flow or something like that. And so what does that mean? What does it mean weakly impose boundary conditions? They basically have a force that's imposed along the boundary of a, and this is not for a moving boundary case, it's just for this a regular kind of case. We've got a force. And and the way to think about it is it's um it's it's a mismatch between the wall velocity, wall velocity is for a stationary wall zero, um, and the fluid velocity right next to the wall. And um Oh, there it is. Okay, and so this is like a this is like a frictional force, and they argued that you can sort of um, you can sort of do something like a dimensional analysis to 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 choose the penalty friction term to correspond to a particular sort of um, uh, a, a particular sort of model of what the uh, of what the boundary layer should look like. And so, the, so the idea with with this kind of a thing is you're like, okay, I've got my grid. I'm not resolving the boundary layer. And so, if you're not resolving the boundary layer, then the then in some sense there should be a mismatch between the velocity of, in the grid and the velocity on the boundary. They're just saying, okay, we're going to have frictional force. And they show that when you do this, it's better than strongly imposing a no slip boundary condition on the wall when you're under resolved, when you're not capturing the boundary layer. You can do the same kind of thing for immersed boundary methods. So this is what this is what um, often is called direct forcing immersed boundary methods. So direct forcing immersed boundary methods have forces that look like frictional penalty forces. Um, it's the mismatch between the velocity that you want on the structure and the velocity that you get from the fluid. Um, and and I think, although I've never done it, I think you could use that as a way of of doing something like a subgrid model of uh, describing the mismatch between the kind of bulk velocity and the wall velocity in, um, in like a LES kind of context. Now the problem is that these kind of methods do very poorly, at least in my experience. Um, I mean, maybe maybe I, I don't maybe I, I just don't know the the special sauce. But so they they work great for shear, but if you want to use the same kind of approach for pressure loading, you've got a really big pressure load on the wall because it's friction stuff can go through the wall and that's not great it's like if you want to do val heart valves it's not it's, it's it, it does in my experience it doesn't work but if you want to do kind of like external flows they, these kind of methods work great actually and i think you can rationalize what they're doing is some kind of wall model for a tur uh, for, for a turbulence uh setup interesting so uh, we're running a little over so maybe let's uh, just thank voice and save questions for after <laughs> Well,
ever seen there was a Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 